Our next speaker is uh, Professor Yuli Mora from ETH uh, Zurich, and his talk is entitled The Constructive Approach to Cryptography and Information Theory. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to the organizers, to Mayor. I gladly accepted the invitation, and I'm very glad I actually came, not only because you're such good hosts and take care of your visitors, but also because every single talk I heard today was actually very enlightening for me. I'm not flattering the speakers. It was really very interesting for me from very diverse areas. Um, in one of the talks I heard about, you know, playing Beethoven actually with a signal of one hertz bandwidth. Uh, I thought about compressing the talk at the, being at the end into a few minutes, but I'm not sure if the same thing works in the time domain. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll be flexible. You may ask questions. I will be able to cut parts, and I will not go over time. So we take it easy. Uh, this talk is about uh, two ways of describing it. One way would be to say it, 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 it continues with the previous talk, explaining what the security metric he was talking about several metrics could and should be. Uh, uh, but actually, the motivation is, is, goes far beyond that. It's somehow, how can we build correct protocols? You, you may know that protocols like TLS that you're using every day, they get broken from time to time, not because the implementation is wrong, the code is wrong, but the definition of the protocol is wrong. And then people fix that. You know, certain fields need to also be encrypted or something needs to be done and so on. And then, and then again patched and then again broken and so on. How can that be given the fact that the cryptographic community, you know, generally consists of intelligent people. They prove their results. We just heard a talk about proving security. And then if you, if you design protocols, things collapse. How can that be? Okay, the talk is about that. Uh, and I start by something that motivated this talk more than 10 years ago. I asked a very provocative question, namely, if we generate secret keys by some kind of cryptographic protocol, which we do, you do, if we, if we use uh, internet protocols, can we actually use them? Can you, we use them for encryption? Of course, we do that, but the question is, can we? And I do an example, maybe the clearest example to show that this makes sense. I mean, one-time pad encryption is provably secure. Okay, I'll explain it later, but this is the mother of all crypto systems, which is provably secure, provably even against an all-powerful adversary with infinite computing power. And also quantum key distribution, quantum cryptography, even though you might not know what this is about, the, the whole point of it is it's provably secure against an all-powerful adversary, even with infinite quantum computers, okay? So it should be obvious that if you, and this is what people do, if you do quantum cryptography and then you use the key for the one-time pad encryption, you have a provably secure scheme, okay? And I asked this question, uh, to one of my students 10 years ago, uh, why should that be the case? It seems a stupid question, right? I mean, you have security proofs for both schemes. Why is it the case then that the combination is provably secure? Okay? And the surprising answer was that it's not. Okay? So what we could show is, you can, we could show how you break one-time pad encryption done with a provably secure quantum key distribution system uh, and you can still break it. Even though each individual proof is correct, uh, how can that be? Okay? Something wrong must have been proven, obviously, and this relates to the question, what should we prove, which relates to the previous talk. Okay? Uh, it, had to, it had to be fixed, though. My, uh, this was, my student was Renato Renno, with whom I'm also developing this theory that I'm talking about. And, and this required, of course, new security definitions for quantum key distribution and so on, so that such a thing can't happen. And this is what this talk is about. How can we avoid that such a thing happens? So the theme of the talk is modularity of statements or composition. How can we compose individual statements into a combined statement that has actually has a meaning and, and doesn't fall apart? That's what the talk is about. Okay. And I could even ask the, the following question for, for this audience who's more coding theory, information theory. Who, what makes you believe that if you build error correcting codes somewhere in a layer, in the lower layer, so that you get 
an error-free transmission, and then I build cryptography on top that the two won't, won't interfere. What makes us believe that the abstraction of a, a reliable communication is right for the purpose of doing crypto? Okay? It seems a similarly stupid question like the one about quantum crypto, but these are the kind of questions we should have an answer to and not just some intuition. Okay? So I show you one slide now, which is, not, which is maybe supposed to scare you, but it shows you how cryptography is done today. So if you would enter the crypto community, you would see uh, all papers full of what I'm now describing. I'm describing the notion of a public key crypto system. It doesn't matter what I'm describing. I only want to, give, uh, to transmit the idea of how such definitions look like. Uh, the, uh, such a crypto system has a key generation algorithm, an encryption algorithm, a decryption algorithm, not surprisingly, somehow. There must be correctness. If you decrypt, you must get back the message. And then there's a security condition. Okay? It's a definition that I won't read to you, but it, it's a pretty complicated definition. And it's, it, it contains terms like polynomial time. So everything I'm explaining is asymptotic and so on, negligible probability and so on. It's, it's a complicated thing. And the question that arises is actually two questions. One is, what does that definition mean? Okay, you, you don't recognize it, what could it mean? Can you use that in an application? Where can you use this security definition in a concrete application? Will it be secure? Do you need a stronger definition than this one? Okay. And this is the kind of question that is not really answered in the theory that we have. Uh, which is the right definition for a given application, internet application? What do you need? Okay. That's question number one, which seems, of course, relevant if you want to prove the security at the end of your TLS protocol or replacement for it. Uh, you, you, must be, you must know what you're doing. You must be able to answer these questions. Okay. And the second question is, uh, are all these artifacts that are intrinsic in the entire cryptographic literature, like Turing machines, asymptotics, polytime, negligible, etc., etc., are they necessary? Is this what we have to live with? Okay. And my answer to the first question is constructive cryptography. It's in the title of the talk. And this, the answer to the second question is abstraction. Claiming that this is not necessary, one can deal with cryptography in a, in a similar way as in algebra, where, for example, if you prove the result that a times 0 is 0, this is, of course, a, a theorem for, uh, for the ring axioms. And you would not Try it, you prove it abstractly and not for somehow a concrete instantiation of the ring. In the same spirit, you can do cryptography abstractly, but I will not talk much about it except the talk is, uh, uses this kind of abstraction. Okay? I will focus on constructive cryptography, and in fact, uh, because it's for this audience, I will extend it to information theory. Maybe getting back to the answer of the previous talk, what should have been the right security metric in, 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 in his words. So let me start with something that's familiar to a coding theory audience. I start with uh, channel coding, okay? How can we think about error correcting codes? Now I just present a viewpoint that's natural to everyone, but I make it explicit. And the viewpoint is the following. We start from a noisy channel that has a some error probability, which here I call delta. And what we do is we do some kind of encoding and some kind of decoding and the idea of, of doing this is that we achieve a channel which is error-free, which allows us to transmit fewer bits, okay, that's, that's a, pr a price we pay, but the idea is we get the abstraction of an error-free channel, okay, uh, almost, okay, and the question could be that I address later, what is the metric, if, if it's almost, how close are we, okay. Uh, and the point I make, I can write this picture also as a sort of an algebraic equation. I can also draw it more abstractly and say this is a, a system R, a resource R, where if you attach two objects, also systems on the left and the right, then you get this system here. That's the abstraction that's taking place, right? You, it's beyond just doing error correcting codes. And I can also write it as a, as a more algebraic looking equation. Uh, where you, you just draw system equations, basically, okay? So I hope this way of talking about error correcting codes is completely natural. In fact, you may say that's how you think about it. You construct something that's error free, okay? And the interesting thing is that 
in, in cryptography, people think very differently. Uh, but we should be thinking in this way. And the talk is about how you could do it. So I, I view this, what's happening here, as a construction. I say, I've constructed a declared system, a noise-free channel, error-free channel, from something weaker, okay, which is a, this, this system R, which is a noisy channel, by some construction, in this case, encoding, decoding. Uh, and I have some notion of what construction means. It's this blue arrow. It has to be defined. Here it's defined in a certain way. For cryptography, it has to be defined differently. Okay? So let me just spend a few minutes or, uh, explaining this construction paradigm. What are we doing here? It's a very general paradigm that's used in any constructive discipline, which is why I call this constructive cryptography. It's the paradigm of starting from declared and specified resources R, constructing some better resources S via some constructor alpha according to some construction notion. If you construct software, you build software based on modules that satisfy some specification. You get a better system and, and you prove correctness possibly based on the correctness assumptions of the modules. If you build a house, you build it from components. If you build any machine, you build it from components according to specifications. That's the, the idea that's underlying here. And I give examples. I just presented error correcting codes as an example. But there are lots of other examples. Uh, for example, pseudorandom generators in cryptography. Or, or if you generate a secret key, by some protocol, quantum key distribution, for example, you want that you have constructed a key, not that some security notion that you don't understand holds. You want that by executing that protocol, you get the key, and you can use it as if it were a key. Okay? Uh, also, complexity theoretic reductions are constructions, uh, and so on. So what is it? It's, maybe I, I will not talk abstractly about the construction. It's clear what one wants. The, the basic thing you want is composability. You want that if you have an, a way to construct S from R using alpha, and you have another way to construct T from S using beta, you would expect that if you combine alpha and beta as one, you, you get directly T from R. Okay? Now, this is an abstract property that such a construction can have. A construction formula is a relation. Okay? It can have this property. Or it can't. And of course, we want that the construction notion we'll be using has the property. By that, we get modularity. We can design a protocol that does the first thing, an authentication protocol, for example. And then we design an encryption protocol. And if we combine both, we know it's going to be secure. They don't interact badly with each other. Okay? So let me explain constructive cryptography uh, with a simple example, which is the one-time pad encryption. Uh, one-time pad encryption is, is, as I explained earlier, it's a provably secure encryption scheme where the idea is you have a message that's input, a key of the same length, these are bits, then the, this is XOR, added modulo 2, and the ciphertext is transmitted over the insecure channel. And of course, if the receiver knows the same key, he can add it again or subtract it, which is the same, and get back to the plain text. And it's easy to see that the ciphertext is statistically independent of the message if the key is random. Okay? So an adversary reading the ciphertext will not get any information about uh, the message. Easy to see, provably secure. Of course, you cannot reuse the key. That's why it's called one-time pad. And also, that's why it's not very practical. You need a new key each time you do encryption. Okay? But it's provably secure. Okay? Uh, well, what, how do we prove security? Well, I just mentioned, Shannon showed this, that uh, if you use the one-time pad, you get perfect secrecy according to his notion, which, which simply means the ciphertext that the adversary would observe is statistically independent of the message, hence gives no information. Okay? Now, is this a good statement? It seems a very, very strong statement, and it seems like this is good to use. We used it before with quantum key distribution and uh, hoped that we didn't fail. So we can ask, is this really the statement we would want to make about this crypto system? Or is it possible that we missed something that should have been said? 
Stated differently, what I'm talking about here is how can we design a theory in which we cannot possibly miss something that should have been said? Okay? It must be impossible to miss something. And to make this case, I'd like to convince you that this, this system is actually insecure, even though it's provably secure, for two different reasons. If you teach this to students, they would, a clever student would come up and say, this is not true, it's not provably secure, what are you telling us? Okay? Uh, one reason is the following, that... Of course, an adversary who's sitting on the channel can flip individual bits. And the effect of doing that would be that the, the corresponding si uh, plaintext bits would be flipped. So if, if the adversary knows my account number to which transac the transaction is going, he can simply add a few bits so that it, it's transformed into his account number and the money will flow to his account. Okay? That's completely insecure. Why? Well, it's insecure because we somehow didn't say explicitly, maybe implicitly thought about it, but didn't say explicitly that the channel uh, should, of course, be authenticated. We're talking about transmitting this over a channel where the adversary cannot flip bits. He can see everything, but not flip bits. Okay? Who could have forced us to have said this in the beginning so that we don't run into this complaint? Okay? Well, anyway, there is a second criticism of the one-time pad, namely I, I now claim that even the secrecy doesn't hold. Even though this can be proven, uh, it's not secret. Imagine you transmit a message, uh, it's just a, a single message that says yes or no okay, to your receiver. Then I would watch as an adversary, I would watch the channel and would say, oh, if I see two bytes, that must have been known. If I see three bytes, that must be yes. Okay? And it's completely insecure. Okay? And we somehow didn't think of it when we made the statement. Again, what can, could have forced us to make a statement in which this cannot possibly happen, that we forgot something? Okay? It's about this composition, the modularity, that what we say in one paper, in one thing, can, cannot have a, a hidden effect in another thing. You're saying the length of the message what I, what I want to point at is that th this, this, this one-time pad encryption uh, leaks the length of the message. Obviously, I'm, it's, not a, it's not a huge insight that I'm presenting, but it's just a fact that wasn't said before in these worlds, right? Of course, it leaks the length. So if you have an application where the message is a different length, the length leaks. You just have to be aware of it. And if your application is vulnerable to that because you don't have fixed length messages, that's what you get. Okay. So it's a, the question is about declaring exactly what you get, under which exactly declared assumptions. Okay. That's one of the solutions. Okay, I didn't think of that one. <laughs> okay, so I explained the one-time pad in in constructive crypto. What how we, it would look like? Okay, it would look like this. You'd explicitly declare the resources. These are now like the noisy channel in, the error, in a channel coding example. I declare explicitly what I assume. Okay? Of course, if my assumptions are wrong, my statement will at the end not be worth much. But I, I declare, I assume I have an authenticated channel. Alice can transmit a message to B. Eve will see it. It's not secret, but it's authenticated. Okay? And also, I assume I have a secret key, which the adversary knows nothing about. This is my assumption. Then I do one-time pad encryption, where you take in a message add the key and send it over the channel, and you do decryption. So you see already I have the same format as in the channel coding, except encoding, decoding is now replaced by encryption, decryption. Okay? But it's the same format of thinking. And then I declare what I hope to achieve, like an error-free transmission, an error-free channel, except in this case what I hope to achieve is an, a channel a secure channel where Alice can send a message, Bob receives it, and Eve sees nothing. Okay? Of course, you don't achieve it because Eve in this system achieves, sees something. She sees the ciphertext being transmitted, while here she doesn't see anything. So there is a mismatch between these pictures. But what I can say is that Eve, if she were thinking about this experiment and would try to think about do I li rather live in the real world where this is going on or in this idealized world where I don't see anything? It doesn't matter to me because I could simulate what I'm seeing here. I could just output a string, a random string, and this would then be the same as here. 
So if, if she would do that, this system would be the same as the system at the, at the top, and hence this is what we achieve thanks to such a simulation argument. And at this point, we see that the argument is actually flawed unless we explicitly leak the length of the message, because if we don't, the simulator doesn't know how long the string should be that it outputs, the random string. Right? So you explicitly have to leak the message in this model so that you can actually make this argument. Okay? So now we can say we again have a construction notion that if you do this, this is just an algebraic way of writing this picture. Okay? So this is, uh, this is just a formula that should say the same as the picture. Uh, we get an equality of systems where the lower picture is the same as, as the top picture. That's what this equation says. And I can call this in a construction. I can say, if you give me a key and an authenticated channel, the one-time pad constructs a secure channel from it. Hopefully, the construction notion will compose that I can then use that secure channel in any application where I can just imagine I have a, a really a secure channel, not an encryption implementing a secure channel, and that these things will compose. Okay? In fact, you can now generalize this to the computational security. Uh, you can say if you use normal encryption and decryption, you should, by symmetric encryption scheme, not, now, now, not the one-time pad in this case, you should still get this construction. That's what we demand from encryption. Of course, there is a, somehow a metric. It's only closely achieved, but this is the idea. Okay? Just as a remark regarding the previous talk, it's not semantic security that you want. It's this intuition that if you transmit something, it's sent over a secure channel. Okay? This is what you want. If you build, if anybody, any engineer builds something, he has this intuition in mind. Okay? And, and you want that it's actually true. And this is what I'm talking about. Okay? So this, this construction notion for cryptography would be this. S is constructed from R via this protocol encryption decryption if there is this simulator that I showed before such that the equation holds. Okay? In fact, there, uh, you could draw a picture like this uh, where it doesn't matter whether we draw formulas or pictures. And there is a second condition that I will not talk about. This is the correctness condition that, of course, if, even if no adversary is there, the, trend, the message should get through. Right? If, if the adversary isn't there, you still want the message to get through. Um, okay. So the question now arises, where do we get the key from and where do we get the authenticated channel from? Because we assumed we have them. The internet isn't authenticated. Okay? We don't have a key to begin with. But the idea now is that we can construct these gadgets from something else and without having to think, we can then plug them in and connect to that encryption protocol I discussed before and this must work. Okay? Cannot fail. Uh, so let me talk about how you can construct a key. Uh, if you have an authenticated communication in one direction and authenticated communication in the other direction, for example, implemented by certificates over the internet, then you can use a, a key agreement protocol, Diffie-Hellman, for example, Diffie-Hellman protocol, uh, over these channels, and what you get is a secret key, the, the gadget we saw before, but now it's constructed and can then be plugged into the other construction. Uh, so the Diffie-Hellman protocol construct, can be seen as constructing a secret key from authenticated communication. Again, you could now look up the literature, what are security definitions for key agreement protocols, and you would find lengthy, complicated definitions, but this is what you actually want. Okay? But you want that you can use the key that you get. You get a key. Okay? Um, now we can go to information theoretic uh, questions. For example, uh, you can say, well, this only works if you make computational assumptions. Now I'm in the introductory slides of the previous talk. You know, we have to make a computational assumptions. What if we want information theoretic security? This is not possible. So one can prove that given these resources, you cannot construct a key. This is impossible if the security has to be information theoretic. But you can if you assume a little more, an additional auxiliary resource that gives some kind of information to Alice, Bob, and Eve. And I'll give you one example where this is possible. The example that comes maybe closest to actually being 
practical. Uh, and let me give this example. Uh, it's it's a, a scenario where you have some kind of source of randomness. It could be a satellite or a deep space radio source that transmits bits to everyone. Everybody, it's broadcast bits. Everybody can see them. Except that Alice and Bob, they're connected by an, a channel which is perfectly tapped by Eve. So Eve sees every bit that they communicate. <laughs> Alice and Bob share nothing at the beginning. Okay, so imagine they. It's just me talking to you, and now we, we have this channel, but the adversary sees everything that we're transmitting. I'm talking to you. We have nothing that we shared. We didn't talk to each other before, okay? All we can use is the signal from the satellite. However, um, the error rate is very bad. We have cheap equipment. We just use our mobile phones, uh, and we have a very bad error rate of the, uh, uh, the bits transmitted by satellite maybe 49.9 bits of error, independently. So we share almost nothing at the end of this. And the adversary has a huge antenna, this is supposed to signal a huge antenna, and has almost perfect reception of the signal from the satellite. Not totally perfect, but almost. And in such a setting, Alice and Bob can actually talk back and forth. So if you have such a satellite setting, this would be the satellite in this case, the setting, then you, they can talk back and forth and actually construct uh, a secret key using several rounds of interaction. And it's provably secure information theoretically. I will not explain how this works, but this is an example that I think is not too far from being realistic. Okay. Um, let me explain again what I mean by composition. Um, what I mean by composition is that if you, for example, have a key agreement protocol that I explained before that gives you a secret key and you plug it into encryption, which we saw if you have a key and authenticated channel, you get a secure channel, the composition should hold. From all these authenticated channels that you are using, you get, using doing both, you get a secure channel. Okay? But I explained earlier that for the case of quantum key distribution, although provably secure, it wasn't the case. Okay, this, this was false. The composition did not hold. It was false. It had to be redone, freshly done. Okay? And nobody had even realized that this could potentially be possible because the definition seemed like a very strong one. Okay? What would the wiretap channel look like uh, in this case? So we would have or a broadcast, a, a Chisal kernel type broadcast channel. It would be a resource where Alice has an input and Bob and Eve have an output. And you would do some kind of clever coding. We saw how that can be done in the previous talk. And you would hope that what you achieve is a secure channel. Okay, that's the idea. So if we ask now what is the security metric or the security definition we should be using, it's this one. It's, it's the one that says you get a secure channel very closely, okay, up to epsilon. Of course, that one can now ask, is this equivalent to the notion in the previous talk? And the answer would be close to yes. Okay, but, but this should be the definition because why? You want composition, you want to be able to use what you're getting. Okay? Um, also, if you take such a viewpoint, you realize that maybe that the, the setting one is looking at was a bit artificial. Uh, namely, it could be that you have more resources. For example, we live in a world where you have the, a permanent connection over the internet. Yes, it's insecure, but it exists. So what happens if we can use it? We use the fact that we can authentically communicate. Okay? Well, we first have to create authentication. In that case, it turns out that unlike in the case where you don't... Oops, that wasn't the intention. How do I get back? Control that, okay? Right. Um, in this case, if you take Chisal kernel, you see that if the, if, the, if the adversary's channel is better than Bob's channel, of course, you can't do anything. There is no communication, secret communication that would be possible. If you allow for a simple modification of the model where you have an authenticated channel, not secure, the adversary sees everything, 
you can even get uh, secure communication if this channel is much better than Bob's channel, for example. So thinking in a constructive way, explicitly declaring what you're assuming and what you're constructing, you also have new insights of what kind of question you could ask. Okay. Now, for the last five or ten minutes, what, how much time do I have? Okay. I, I'd like to talk about the metric for systems. Okay, we, we, we argued that we want to achieve something closely. It's not perfectly possible we want to get close. How could that closeness be defined? Okay. Uh, and I look first at the special case of random variables. So if you have a system that outputs a random variable V, how do you measure that it's close to a system that outputs a uniform random variable. So here I'm asking the question, how bad is it if we have a secret key which is not exactly uniform, how bad is it? How, what's the epsilon distance to a uniform key? Because now we could use different types of definitions, but the question would then be which is the right one. Okay? Yeah, that's a question we can ask among the many possible, which is the right one. So uh, a traditional information theorist might say, in the spirit of the early papers, papers in this field, and even papers written today, that the answer could be, well, you know, if, if V is not uniform, it's, its entropy is not maximal, so we take the difference of entropy as, as the, how bad it is. Okay? If it's still close to uniform, uh, if, it's, if the entropy is close to maximal, that's fine. Okay? But the question still remains, should we use a different distance measure? What is the right distance measure? And what I argue is that it should actually be the statistical distance. This is not surprising, uh, perhaps, but it should be the statistical distance uh, between the two random variables. That's the right notion of security that you should be addressing. And you should be proving if you, if you give proof. So theorems about information theoretic security should not talk about entropy conditions that you guarantee to be satisfied, they should talk about distance. Okay? Because that is the metric that will compose. Okay? Uh, so it's the distance from uniform of a key that determines how bad it is if you use that key instead of a, a purely random key. Another question could be, in the, I go back to the channel example. The question would be, what's, what's the metric for this, how should I measure how bad a channel is compared to a perfect channel? What's the right distance measure? Okay, that's a question that now comes up. Again, not totally surprisingly, but we now have an answer because we, we have a construction notion and the answer is given by the construction notion. We can now figure out what it is. And of course, it will not be an average kind of argument this will be wrong, it'll be the worst case. The, distance, the, the answer is it's the worst case distance between uh, the conditional distributions uh, for the worst cho choice of the input. So you take the worst choice of the input and then you take the distance between the conditional distribution of this channel and the, and the other channel, if you want the distance between channel measures. Yes, this is a bit unfortunate. This is supposed to be the distance between channels, and this is the distance uh, between distributions. Yes, sorry. Now, taking this further, I have to give you the answer of what would be the distance for these kind of systems, right? Because I claim these are close. Uh, what is, it's not a channel, it's now a complicated system that can interact with many interfaces. In this case, it's three interfaces. What is this object and what is the distance measure on the object, okay? So, what, the, how to measure the distance, how to define it? Uh, and, and of course, we first have to ask, what is a discrete system? What is the object we talk about of which we will then try to define a distance measure on? Um, so here's a discrete system. It takes inputs and produces outputs. We actually saw this in Chaim's talk this morning, an object of this type. Uh, he would call it a, a channel with memory. Uh, in this case, it's not a transmission channel. It's just an abstract system that takes inputs and outputs. It's not intended to transmit information. We're not trying to maximize capacity or something. Uh, 
And the question is, how is this object characterized? Well, it's, I call this a random system, but it's mathematically the same kind of object as, a, as such a channel. It's simply a sequence of conditional probability distributions. Okay? This is what this object is. Uh, it tells you how the next y is generated based on all the previous xi's and the, uh, all the xi's and the previous y's. Okay? And in particular, we don't talk about memory in the channel or a state or anything uh, because this is the mathematical object I'm talking about. There can be many instantiations and descriptions of it, machines that have memory, particular type of states and so on, but the object itself is this. Two different descriptions can be equivalent in the sense that they describe the same mathematical object. So a theory that talks about these systems, it's a theory about these objects. Okay? Uh, there is a redundant description by saying just it's the, it's the conditional distribution of all the outputs given all the inputs. Okay? We could also think like that. And now you could start asking questions about this interesting object. Questions like, what is the entropy of such an object? How much entropy do you need to implement it? Okay, what, how much randoms can you extract from such an object? This is not the kind of question I'm asking here. I'm asking a question that is of interest in this constructive theory, and that's the question of distinguishing. Okay, how can I distinguish two objects, respectively prove that they're not distinguishable, that they're, that they're very close? Okay. So again, I'm talking about such objects, S, and now I'm introducing the metric, the distance measure of these objects, by introducing the concept of a distinguisher. It's, an, again, a system that would play with S, and it outputs a bit. Somehow it says 0 or 1. And the idea is that, uh, well, this, is, this will be the distribution of the complete transcript if you run it for k messages. It'll output x to the k, y to the k, and, and a w bit. Okay? And we can now define the metric for two systems st. What is the distance? I now give it a name that is not in conflict with before. Uh, the distance for a distinguisher d asking k queries would be simply the difference in the two random experiments on the left and on the right that the distinguisher outputs a one. Okay? That's a standard way of defining uh, a distance to indistinguishability in, in cryptography. Okay? And now we maximize over all such distinguishers. We allow arbitrary distinguishers and then we get the metric we were looking for. Okay? So now, for the last few minutes, I'd, I'd just like to briefly mention a few things one can say about uh, this metric. That this actually leads to an interesting theory. Okay, that, uh, I will not talk about how to prove the indistinguishability, meaning the smallness of the metric, the closeness of two systems, because that, that will be essential in, in doing constructive crypto. I, I show something else, uh, namely, uh, security amplification. Okay, so the idea is somehow that if we have something that's all a little bit close, can we get construct something that's very close? And I'll give you an example. So here is a, a Dilbert uh, cartoon which explains the hardness of generating randomness. Uh, well, you can read it yourself. I don't have to read it to you, but the point is uh, you never, you have some sequence, you never know whether it's random, okay? Or you have a, a, a random bit generator, you want to test it, you can't test whether it's random, okay? Any test you do is sort of partial, okay? Um, so, in reality, we have to live with partial random stuff. And so the idea that comes up is that if you have several partially random things, maybe you can construct something that's strongly random, okay? So, for example, uh, if you have several key sources, but you don't trust, trust them, they're partially random, maybe if you take the XOR, you get something strongly random. Okay? That's what one might hope to be able to prove. Or if you take the cascade of encryption functions, you encrypt again what you've already encrypted, but each of them is only weakly good, 
somehow you hope that the whole thing will be strong. Okay? That's the kind of amplification results I'm after. Okay? So let me do an example with just a random variable. This is a binary random variable that I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's a random variable v and, and v prime. And we want to see what happens if we XOR them. Each of them individually is not random. So the first one is, is 40, 60 biased. Okay, so this is the distribution. And the second one is 30, 70 biased. Okay, so it has a, an offset of 0.1. This one, this has a distance of 0.2 from random. And now, easy calculation, what do you get? You get something which is less biased. Okay, you get a bit which is only 54, 46 biased. Okay, and you can actually show that, uh, this is not hard to see, that the bias you would see here, the distance, is actually twice the product of these two. Okay, that's not hard to see. It's easy calculation. Uh, so we get an amplification. Okay. In fact, you can show a theorem in way, uh, that shows this, that you take any random variable, they can be strings and so on. If you take the XOR, the distance is bounded by twice the product of the distance. Okay, we have a product theorem, it goes down. And uh, uh, this is even true if you replace this by some, any, any quasi-group operation. Okay, it doesn't have to be XOR. But the interesting question is what happens if we now have systems? Okay, this was random variables. What is if we have systems? Okay, let's suppose we have two systems, F and G, and we do the same thing. We, they they're both behave somewhat like random systems. And what we do is we, we take the XOR of the two systems hoping that we get a better system. And indeed, one can show, uh, this is in a paper of 2007, one can show that um, if you do this, and each system is, according to the metric that we saw before, close to F, G is close to an ideal system, a random function R, G is close to a random function R, if you do this XOR, or a general quasi-group operation, you get something which is much closer to R, and if you do many of them, you get exponentially close. Okay, so we get an amplification. The same can be proven for the cascade of permutation of encryptions, if you wish, that you get actually much stronger encryption if you do this, provably so. Uh, okay, so it's a, a similar theorem that you get. Okay, so I, I come to the end of the talk. The, the, the goal of the talk was basically to show that uh, in anything that we do, so this plea goes beyond the crypto community, it goes to this community as well, actually to any community. If we want our statement that we make in our paper to be useful, it has to be applicable in another context. Okay, this is a, of course a, a no-brainer what I'm saying, but I'm talking about what that means. It means that we need sort of a meta way of composing the statements. Right? In, in my case, I would say somebody talking about encryption in his paper, another guy talking about authentication in his paper, we must be able to combine the two and not need a third expert that tries to think about how can that be combined. If that's necessary, the encryption guy or the authentication guy didn't supply to us what we wanted, right? And the same applies even to information theory statements. Had, if you take this viewpoint, you can actually re rethink your own uh, work, and, and, and you will be able to show that you achieve this with slightly different metrics. You won't, won't be talking about entropy and so on, but this is what you should be doing in a certain sense, because you want to know that it means something to somebody else who would be using it. And of course, we would only use what you're saying because we want to use it to do secure transmission in application and so on. Okay. And this goes, as I said, this is actually in any field. It's, it's almost a philosophical uh, plea that in any community you work in, please make statements that are not only mathematically interesting in itself, but that actually have a use in a defined way, where composition is defined, what would it mean to be used? Okay. So we, in, particularly in the, in the field of information theoretic security, we should actually revisit entropy-based definitions. Uh, entropy is a, a fantastic tool and quantity and so on, but it's not the quantity you want to see in a theorem, you want to see it in the proof of the theorem because it's a very useful quantity, but it's not the, theory, the quantity that should appear in the theorem statement itself because you don't know how to compose it, okay? Uh, often, of course, if I say the entropy is almost maximal of my key, 
very, very, very exponentially close to maximal, that also means that the distance is very close to maximal. There's a translation, but it, I should be making the second statement of the first. Uh, the, the idea of this approach that I explained is that cryptography now is a clear semantics. Rather than having security definitions that for that kind of distribution, the adversary will not be able to guess that function of something, etc., you get a secure channel. We have clear semantics. We can compose. Okay? Uh, and that actually leads to a modular design of protocols. So if we design now a protocol like TLS, we define it in a modular way. Each step is easily seen to be provable. Okay? And the overall protocol is secure by composition. We don't have to do a new proof. It's, that's the idea. So we, we're now working on applying this to a real protocol design. Of course, there are lots of things to be modeled. You can only get a proof for what you actually have modeled and so on. But uh, that's the goal. And by that, I, I thank you. You, you find some other questions. Questions for you? Uh, just a, a statement backing up your last slide. Um, so the editor of a math journal um, notices of the American Society. So he, he believes that maybe 30 or 40 percent of all math papers are wrong in the following sense. Um, it's not the argument, but in the statement of the theorem, there's something not really right there. And nobody really catches it because of something psychological in the presentation of the text around it, but that, that melts away once you boil it down to what does the, what's the actual statement of yes. the theorem. Yes. So the interface between the result and the outside world is faulty. I think that's related yes. to your energy. How would you, I mean, this is the gadget that cryptographers work with, and they prove the security. Like somebody would say, I have a new crypto system, and provably if factoring is hard, it satisfies this definition. That's the kind of papers, intellectually very uh, interesting papers. I'm not accusing the authors of not doing interesting things, but. Do you think if you have this definition satisfied, you can use this to build something? What does it tell you? You don't. And I think it's this gap. Uh, 